all men are fascinated by one or the other thing that surrounds them. Some people are fascinated by sports, others by flora and fauna. I am Kapila here to make you meet with one such person who was fascinated by butterflies through the reading of the chapter, The Making of a Scientist, which tells us about one such man, Richard Ebright. Let's begin. At the age of 22, a former scout of the year excited the scientific world with a new theory on how cells work. Richard H. A. Bright and his college roommate explained the theory in an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. So, it tells us that it was the age of 22 when Richard A. Bright and one of his uh, um, colleagues, they were the ones who told uh, through a paper there to an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science about how the cells they work. It was the first time this important scientific journal had ever published the work of college students. So because they were very young and they were still in college and they had done a sensational work there, it came to the knowledge of everyone. And it was for the first time that it happened that a journal like that was published in that book for the first time of any college student. In sports, that would be like making the big leagues of at the age of 15 and hitting a home run your first time at bat. For Richard Ebright, it was the first in a long string of achievements in science and other fields. And it all started with butterflies. So this huge achievement that was made by Richard Ebright was all because of the fascination that he had towards butterflies and the comparison of the achievement that or which those people had made at that young age, those two college boys had made at that young age, has been made with the achievement of a player at the age of 15 who makes a home run and who achieves laurels and applauds there in that game. So this is a comparison that they are making here. An only child, Ebright grew up north of Reading, Pennsylvania. There wasn't much I could do there, he said. I certainly couldn't play football or baseball with a team of one. But there was one thing I could do, collect things. So this Richard Ebright has told himself he was at a place called Reading in Pennsylvania and there there were no, not too many people there. He was all alone and one man cannot play bas baseball or football. And so what he could do was only collect things. So he did and did he ever. Beginning in kindergarten, Ebright collected butterflies with the same determination that has marked all his activities. He also collected rocks, fossils and coins. He became an eager astronomer too, sometimes stargazing all night. So this is what all he did when he was young and that he began at the age when he was there in kindergarten. He started collecting the butterflies and all because he was at a place where he didn't get company, he couldn't play and apart from butterflies he used to collect many other things also. From the first, he had a driving curiosity along with a bright mind. He also had a mother who encouraged his interest in learning. She took him on trips, bought him telescopes, microscopes, cameras, mounting materials and other equipment and helped him in many other ways. So it was not only that he was interested, he got a very uh, encouraging mother also who would help her out with all the kinds of instruments and equipments that he needed for the study and all. She would buy microscope and telescope and mounting materials on which you mount the slides and all, everything she would do and she would encourage the child to study and learn whatever he wanted to. I was his only companion until he started school, his mother said. After that, I would bring home friends for him. But at night, we just did things together. Richie was my whole life, 
after his father died when Richie was in third grade. So the mother was dedicated to the child because the father died at the age of three. When Richie was at the age of three, uh, his father died. And since then, he was the whole life of his mother and the mother completely dedicated to the child's learning and studies. She and her son spent almost every evening at the dining room table. If he didn't have things to do, I found work for him. Not physical work, but learning things, his mother said. He liked it. He wanted to learn. So there was a quench of learning that the mother had observed. And whenever he didn't have any other work, the mother would get some work so that he may learn. What kind of work she used to get? She never got some physical work. Rather, she got a work which would help him learn about that particular thing. She had come to know that the child was very interested in learning about things. And this is how she helped the child. And learn he did. He earned top grades in school. On everyday things, he was just like every other kid, his mother said. By the time he was in the second grade, a bride had collected all 25 species of butterflies found around his hometown. So all the 25 species, there's a box here and in that, uh, the name of the species have been written here. So he collected all of them which were found in his hometown. That probably would have been the end of my butterfly collecting, he said. But then my mother got me a children's book called The Travels of Monarch 10. That book, which told how monarch butterflies migrate to Central America, opened the world of science to the eager young collector. So since that uh, moment, uh, that the mother got that book he you know had developed that quench in him how what all is there how do the butterflies they migrate and that he learned from that book which was given to him by the mother so till then he was just a collector he just collected those things but once he read that book about monarch butterflies migration to central america he couldn't stop and from there began the journey at the end of the book, readers were invited to help study butterfly migrations. They were asked to tag butterflies for research by Dr. Frederick A. Ocart of the University of Toronto, Canada. Ebright's mother wrote to Dr. Ocart and soon Ebright was attaching light adhesive tags to the wings of monarchs. Anyone who found a tagged butterfly was asked to send the tag to Dr. Ocart. So at the end of that book, it was written there, uh, invites were asked from the people who read that book if they wanted to study the migration of the butterflies. So the mother helped the child. She knew that he was very much interested in learning. And after writing a letter to Dr. Quart, who was there in the University of Toronto, Canada, they learned how to tag the butterflies. And he started tagging the butterflies' wings with light tags. And they had to send the tag then to Dr. Ukwat. This is how they began through that book because at the end of the book, it was written all about the study of migration of the butterflies. The butterfly collecting season around reading lasts six weeks in late summer. So reading is the name of a place. So in that place, it was about six weeks in the late summer. You could collect the butterflies. If you are going to chase them one by one, you won't catch very many. So the next step for a bride was to raise a flock of butterflies. Because one by one, if you are going to catch them, you will not be able to catch too many butterflies. And then you know the more the number, the more is the accuracy of the data that you collect. So that's the reason why a bride thought of raising a flock of butterflies. He would catch a female monarch. Monarch is the type of the butterfly take her eggs and raise them in his basement through their life cycle. From egg to caterpillar to pupa to adult butterfly. So he would raise them there in the basement. He had studied the life cycle. And why did he raise a flock of butterflies? Because he knew very well that one by one, if he would collect the butterflies, it would not be a good number of collection of butterflies. And that would not serve the purpose of the study of migration of monarch butterflies. So he thought of raising a flock of butterflies. 
Then he would tag the butterflies' wings and let them go. For several years, his basement was home to thousands of monarchs in different stages of development. So, because he followed the life cycle, so there were different stages that uh, the thousands of butterflies were there in the basement. Eventually, I began to lose interest in tagging butterflies. It's tedious and there's not much feedback. Why he lost interest in tagging the butterflies? Because it's really very tedious task, very difficult task it is. And there was not much feedback that he was getting. He was not able to learn much about the butterflies through the tagging. And so he lost the interest in tagging of butterflies. Ebright said, in all the time I did it, he laughed. Only two butterflies I had tagged were recaptured. And they were not more than 75 miles from where I lived. So why he lost the interest was because the feedback that he got through the tagging of the butterflies, that was not very much interesting. He, he was not able to learn a lot from that. And out of all the hundreds and thousands of butterflies that he had tagged, only two were recaptured. And that also was not too far away, just 75 miles from his place. Then in the seventh grade, he got a hint of what real science is when he entered a county science fair and lost. So till then, he was just learning about all this and he thought that this is only science. He was really very much interested in the subject of science. But once when he came to seventh grade, that is the seventh class, and he entered into a science fair, which was on county level, like we have got districts and all, they've got county. So district level competitions and fairs are there. Similarly, there they had the county fair, science fair. And once he entered there, he really understood what science was. It was really a sad feeling to sit there and not get anything while everybody else had won something. He could not win anything there in that science fair that was there in the county and he felt very sad about it. And all the others, they had won uh, some or the other kind of thing. Ebright said, his entry was slides of frog tissues, which he showed under a microscope. He realized the winners had tried to do real experiments, not simply make a neat display. So when he visited that particular fair, he understood that it was not only a display there. What he had done was just the tissue of frog that he had displayed over there. But the other people who were the winners over there, they had actually done real experiments. Already the competitive spirit that drives Richard Ebright was appearing. I knew that for the next year's fair, I would have to do a real experiment, he said. The subject I knew most about was the insect work I'd been doing in the past several years. So now he knew that he had to do something which was like a real experiment there if he wanted entry there as a winner in the next science fair. And what he was most compatible and most comfortable with was the insect work because that he had been doing for a very long time. For years, he had been working on the insect. And what insects is he talking about? He's talking about the monarch butterflies. So he wrote to Dr. Quart for ideas and back came a stack of suggestions for experiments. Those kept Ebright busy all through high school and led to prize projects in county and international science fairs. So because he had worked with Dr. Aquat earlier also in the tagging of monarch butterflies, he again took help from him. And when he wrote to him about ideas related to real experiments, Dr. Aquat gave him a whole list of experiments which he could conduct on the butterflies. And all these experiments when he conducted, he really bagged the prizes there throughout those years when he conducted those experiments. And not only in the county fairs he got the prizes, but also in international science fairs he got the prizes. For his 8th grade project, Ebright tried to find the cause of a viral disease that kills nearly all monarch caterpillars every few years. So this was the project that he took up in his 8th grade that why all the caterpillars of monarch butterflies died in that year. Every few years they died. And what was the cause of that particular viral disease? 
Ebright thought the disease might be carried by a beetle. He tried raising caterpillars in the presence of beetles. I didn't get any real results, he said, but I went ahead and showed that I had tried the experiment. This time I won. So he did not get any results when he raised the caterpillars there in the presence of the beetles, but still he won because it was a real experiment that he had conducted, but he could not get any results over there. He thought that the beetles must be causing that viral disease and that is why the caterpillars died, but the, the result wasn't the same. The next year, his science fair project was testing the theory that viceroy butterflies copy monarchs. So, there is another sect of butterflies, another species that is the viceroy species of butterflies. And these viceroy butterflies, they copy the monarch butterflies. The theory was that viceroys look like monarchs because monarchs don't taste good to birds. Viceroys, on the other hand, do taste good to birds. So the more they look like monarchs, the less likely they are to become a bird's dinner. So this was the reason he conducted an experiment, he did research and he gave his theory that the viceroy butterflies, they copied the monarch butterflies because the birds did not eat monarch butterflies as the taste of monarch butterflies wasn't good for the birds. But the viceroy butterflies, they tasted good for birds. And as a result, to save themselves from being eaten by the birds, the viceroy butterflies, they used to copy the monarchs. This was the experiment that he took up, the theory that he gave. Ebright's project was to see whether, in fact, birds would eat monarchs. He found that a starling would not eat ordinary bird food. So he conducted the experiment and what the experiment was, it was all about whether the birds would eat monarch butterflies or not. This was the experiment that he took up. Now the starling is a kind of a bird. So that bird did not eat proper bird feed. The bird feed that was given, the normal bird feed, it did not eat that. It would eat all the monarchs it could get. Ebright said later, research by other people showed that viceroys probably do copy the monarch. This project was placed first in the zoology division and third overall in the county science fair. So this is what he learned through the experiment. The experiment was whether the birds would eat the monarch and he found out that the starling bird, it ate all the monarchs that were there. And later on, it was found out that the viceroys, they copy the monarchs. But this experiment he conducted when he was in 8th class only. And at that time, he won the prize for it. Okay, So it was first in the zoology division and it was third in the overall county science fair. In his second year in high school, Richard Ebright began the research that led to his discovery of an unknown insect hormone. Indirectly, it also led to his new theory on the life of cells. So he got to discover a hormone and that was an insect hormone and that led to the new theory of the life of cells. The question he tried to answer was simple. What is the purpose of the 12 tiny gold spots on a monarch pupa? So because he used to raise a whole flock of butterflies there and he had seen all the different stages, he knew that in the pupa stage of a monarch butterfly, there are 12 gold spots that come there. So what is the reason behind those 12 gold spots? That was what he was founding. He was trying to find, find out the answer for. Everyone assumed the gold spots are just ornamental, Ebright said, but Dr. Aquat didn't believe it. To find the answer, Ebright and another excellent science student first had to build a device that showed that the spots were producing a hormone necessary for the butterfly's full development. So for the development of the butterfly, these spots they were producing some hormones. Now they had to build an instrument and equipment which would let them know that yes, exactly hormone was being secreted by these 12 gold spots. So he and one another excellent brilliant science student together, they made that device. 
This project won a bright first place in the county fair and entry into the International Science and Engineering Fair. There he won third place for zoology. He also got a chance to work during the summer at the entomology laboratory of the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. So now because he did that experiment about the gold spots, he stood first there and he also got an opportunity to work in that research center that was there for entomology laboratory. As a high school junior, Richard Ebright continued his advanced experiments on the monarch pupa. That year, his project won first place at the International Science Fair and gave him another chance to work in the Army Laboratory during the summer. So again, he got a chance because again, he was working on the pupa of monarch butterflies and then his project got selected as the first one. And again, a chance was given to him to work in the Army Laboratory. In his senior year, he went a step further. He grew cells from a monarch's wing in a culture and showed that the cells would divide and develop into normal butterfly wing scales only if they were fed the hormone from the gold spots. So what he did was he grew cells there in culture from the wings of the butterfly and there he proved that only if the hormone from the gold spots were given that would properly grow into a butterfly otherwise won't. So he proved that. That project won first place for zoology at the International Fair. He spent the summer after graduation doing further work at the Army Laboratory and at the laboratory of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So further he worked in these labs. The following summer, after his freshman year at Harvard University, Ebright went back to the laboratory of the Department of Agriculture and did more work on the hormone from the gold spots. Using the laboratory's sophisticated instruments, he was able to identify the hormone's chemical structure. So he was a freshman there at Harvard University, but again, he went back to the laboratory. Why? Because he used to get sophisticated instruments over there that would help him identify the chemical structure of the hormone that came out of the gold spots. So he was able to find out the chemical structure also. A year and a half later, during his junior year, Ebright got the idea for his new theory about cell life. It came while he was looking at x-ray photos of the chemical structure of a hormone. So while he was looking at that chemical structure x-ray of a hormone, he got the idea of the new theory of cell life. When he saw those photos, Ebright didn't shout Eureka or even I've got it. But he believed that along with his findings about insect hormones, the photos gave him the answer of one of biology's puzzles, how the cell can read the blueprint of its DNA. So he didn't shout like the words like Eureka or I have got it, but yes, he got the answer to the question. And what was the question that how the cell can read the blueprint of its DNA. This is how he came to know when he looked at the x-ray there of the chemical structure. DNA is the substance in the nucleus of a cell that controls heredity. It determines the form and function of the cell. Thus, DNA is the blueprint for life. This is what he came to know. Ebright and his college roommate James R. Wong worked all that night drawing pictures and constructing plastic models of molecules to show how it could happen. Together, they later wrote the paper that explained the theory. So obviously, they worked on the model and all and then they wrote the theory and both of them worked together on that project. Surprising no one knew who knew him, Richard Ebright graduated from Harvard with highest honors, second in his class of 1510. Ebright went on to become a graduate student researcher at Harvard Medical School. There he began doing experiments to test his theory. So he was one of the second highest scorer there at university. He surprised everyone and after the graduation also, he entered as a researcher into the Harvard Medical School. If the theory proves correct, 
it will be a big step towards understanding the processes of life. It might also lead to new ideas for preventing some types of cancer and other diseases. So if the experiment would prove right, all these would be the benefits of it. All of this is possible because of Ebright's scientific curiosity. Because he was really wanting to learn. He had that curiosity inside. He had a quench for learning. That's the reason why all of this was possible. His high school research into the purpose of the spots on a monarch pupa eventually led him to his theory about cell life. So that one, you know, curiosity that led him to the theory of cell life. Richard E. Bright has been interested in science since he first began collecting butterflies, but not so deeply that he hasn't time for other interests. So it is not so that because he was so much interested in science, he would not be doing other activities. It was not at all so. He gave equal time to the other things also. Ebright also became a champion debater and public speaker and a good canoeist and all-around outdoors person. He is also an expert photographer, particularly of nature and scientific exhibits. So he has taken out time for the other things also. It's not so that it's only science that is life for him. In high school, Richard Ebright was a straight A student. Because learning was easy, he turned a lot of his energy towards the debating and model United Nations clubs. He also found someone to admire, Richard A. Vihira, his social studies teacher and advisor to both clubs. Mr. Vihira was the perfect person for me then. He opened my mind to new ideas, Ebright said. Richard would always give that extra effort, Mr. Vihira said. What pleased me was, here was this person who put in three or four hours at night doing debate research besides doing all his research with butterflies and his other interests. So he not only researched for butterflies and other interests, rather debating also was he was very fond of. And Mr. Vera, he admired Mr. Vera and he would give him topics there and he would research for the debates also. To debate there, he used to go and research on the topic. So he was really a very hard worker. He used to spend hours in the night to research on the topics of the debate also. Richard was competitive, Mr. Vihira continued, but not in a bad sense. He explained, Richard wasn't interested in winning for winning's sake or winning to get a prize. Rather, he was winning because he wanted to do the best job he could. See, this is the difference uh, between a real winner. He was a real winner because he wanted to do the best of whatever he was doing. For the right reasons, he wants to be the best. So he wants to be the best, but not for any other bad reason, but for the right reasons only, which would be having a good cause, a right cause. And that is one of the ingredients in the making of a scientist. You become a scientist only when you have a good cause after it. You know, you're right about finding out something, finding out about and uh, learning about something in the right manner. So then you are a scientist. You make yourself a scientist then. Start with a first-rate mind and curiosity. So what do you need to be a scientist? You have to start with a first-rate mind. First-rate mind is a very fertile, a beautiful mind, a pure mind you should be having. And you have to have lots and lots of curiosity. Until unless you have the curiosity, you are not going to learn. So you need to have curiosity and mix in the will to win for the right reasons. And then you have to have that willpower also in you that yes, you're going to win for the right reasons. Like he thought why those gold spots were there. So he conducted experiments. So that willpower was there and you have to stand victorious. So all these things are essential in making of a scientist. What are they? First rate mind and then you have curiosity and the will to make you win. Ebright has these qualities from the time the book the travels of Monarch 10 opened the world of science to him. Richard Ebright has never lost 
his scientific curiosity. The curiosity grew deeper and deeper day by day as he went deep into the study of science. So his interest was not lost in science at all from the day he got that book which was brought by his mother. Now let's have a look at the question answers here. Question 1. How can one become a scientist, an economist, a historian? Does it simply involve reading many books on the subject? Does it involve observing, thinking and doing experiments? See, it, uh, it is not all about reading books or just experimenting or thinking or observing. You need to have certain innate values also. You need to like, for example, I would give you the example of uh, how to be a scientist. In the last paragraph of the chapter, it has been told what all qualities we need to have to be a scientist. We need to have a scientific temperament. We need to have that will in ourselves to, you know, find out the answer for the things then we need to have that pure mind, a first rated mind we need to have and that is all what is required to be a scientist. Similarly, to be an economist, to be a historian or something for that matter, you need to have different kind of values and virtues apart from reading books and observing and thinking and experimenting. Let's come to the next question. You must have read about cells and DNA in your science books. Discuss Richard Ebright's work in the light of what you have studied. If you get an opportunity to work like Richard Ebright on projects and experiments, which field would you like to work on and why? Now the last part of the question I cannot answer because that's your own choice. What field would you be choosing to work upon, right? But I would answer the other questions. Richard Ebright found, found out that DNA is, the, uh, is there which takes the hereditary traits and uh, the cell is able to find out the blueprint of the DNA. It tells us about the blueprint of DNA and that is all about uh, hereditary and DNA is there in the nucleus of the cell that also he found out so wonderful job he did and all that he did just from the beginning of the collection of the monarch butterflies if you want to add more into it you can uh, after writing all this you can add briefly also about the research that he made and the topic that you would like to choose to work upon for the experiments and all that you will have to write on your own i don't know your choice please do that next question here children everywhere wonder about the world around them and there have been many questions that have been asked to uh, dr rahul pal and professor yashpal and the questions are given here that are what is dna fingerprinting and what are its uses how do honeybees identify their own honeycombs and why does rain fall in drops so this is homework for you you should all be knowing the answer for these questions this would you know generate in you curiosity to know the answers if you will search yourself for the answers but still if you don't get the answer even after searching you would get it at the end of the video the last slide would have the answers for these questions but i would suggest that you try to find out the answers on your own and then they are in the second question they've asked you to write uh, about the things that make you wonder which are there all around you like you know the golden spots which were there on the pupa uh, it made richard ebright wonder why they were there similarly you might also be wondering on one or the other kind of thing that surrounds you so you can make a list of it We'll be meeting with some other videos there which would be telling us something about scientific temperament. Till then, take care.